Amen, amen. Go ahead and you can have a seat. Give the band a round of applause just for the leading us in wonderful worship, the time they take away from their families to practice, to make sure everything is fluid and, and working together. You've got to love Love what they bring, that we could bring that, you know, to our king, that we could just say, all right, Lord, here, here's where we are. Here's our worship, here's our praise, right? And, and what a wonderful job uh, that they did. Now, I'm sure you're in a phase right now where you're either uh, mourning some of your goals you didn't achieve in 2017, right? Or, or maybe you're thinking about goals in 2018, and I don't know how your goals fared, for 2017, I know personally, uh, in my family, we were able to meet, I would say, a majority of our goals. Uh, I know personally, uh, two goals that I, that I set out for, for 2017, I didn't meet those goals. Um, I had a, a reading goal, and I had a running goal, and I didn't meet them. Now, I ran more, and I read more than I did in 2016, but not as much as I wanted to do in 2017. So I'm readjusting my goals, and I want to give you just, just a side note here. I'm a big goal-oriented person, love doing goals. Let me give you the trick for New Year's goals, for New Year's resolutions. Don't start them until halfway through January. Here's why. You just got back from vacation. You're just cleaning up Christmas. How many of you still have your Christmas tree in your house? How many of you have got Christmas lights? you got to get those goals taken care of, right? So when I actually set my goals, I don't set my goals to start until about midway through January. And I have found, honestly, that it helps me actually achieve my resolutions and not get mad at myself on January 2nd when I already messed up. Right? So that's what I do. I kind of delay it. And so what we do at this time is we're reevaluating some of our goals. Okay? For 2018, one of our big family goals, our big financial family goals, is to aggressively invest in our kids' education is that we are going to try to set aside money so that when they are college bound, there will be something there. There will be something from mommy and daddy. Right now, now, we've done that in small portions, but really we've met some other financial goals before we got there. But this is the year I feel like we really need to start thinking about this strategically. Now, I, I only have 10 years, 10 years until my daughter goes off to college because I'm kicking her out. At 18, she's done. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I, about 10 years, and then I got two more coming that way. And so I'm starting to do research, like what's the best investment? What's going to be the, the biggest payout? What's going what's to do that? Now, this is true for all of our goals. All of our goals are investment. We say to ourselves, if I make small steps now, it'll be big payout later. That's what investment is. So we say to ourselves, if, if I start eating right now, I'm going to lose weight later. If I start making extra payments to my debt now, I will be out of debt later. So I'm asking myself, what do I invest in now that's going to give me the biggest payout in the end? Well, it is hard to figure out. It is super hard. Like, where do I put this stuff? Where, where do I put this money? Where do we put these monies? Where do we put them? Because if you start to look into the stock market, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what's going to go up. When is it going to go down? I, I'm confused. Now, I figured this out. If I can just know how it ends, I'll know how to begin, right? If I just knew the biggest payout in the next 10 years, well, then I'll invest in that now. Well, this is true of all of our goals. If we know the end impact, then we'll know how to invest now. Let me give you an example. Probably the biggest payout in recent history, okay? It's right here. I know you think, wow, Pastor Paul, you really cut back on your coffee intake. No, this is not a cu cup of coffee, okay? This is a K-cup. Raise your hand if you know what this is. Okay, there's coffee inside. You put it in a little machine, coffee comes out, right? It's a gift uh, for me, at least. I love these things. There's a company called Green Mountain Coffee. Green Mountain Coffee. And the whole thing that they do is they make these guys. They make the coffee that goes inside these guys. Now, 20 years ago, about... When they started, their shares sold at about 23 cents a share, okay? Which means this actual K-cup was more expensive than a share in their company. One share, 23 cents. Fast forward 20 years. Do you know how much one share is worth now? $89. Now you're thinking, okay, well, that's not very much. 89 bucks, what's that going to buy you? Think about it. It was 23 cents over here. 
That means if I put $1,000 into this thing in the very beginning, 1000 bucks, do you know what the return would be? $390,000. My kids are going to college. Your kids are going to college. I'm going to jump on this stage like Oprah and be like, you get school, 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 right? I mean, that's the point. Imagine if we could do that. Now, taking that aside, right, we're all kicking ourselves that we didn't invest in those K-cups. But what if I could tell you your K-cup? What if I could tell you this morning the K-cup for your life? What if I could tell you the K-cup for our church? What if I could tell you the best investment you could make because it will pay out in the end? It will be the biggest payout of any goal you ever set, of any investment you ever make. If I could tell you the biggest payout, the K-cup, if you will, if I could tell you that, would you invest today? This is what the Apostle Paul puts before his church. He's speaking to a church that he planted, a church that he partnered with in the very beginning. He kind of brought up these believers, these early believers, and then he spoke to them, and this is what he spoke to them about. What he's trying to give them is this. He's telling them as a church, as individuals, as a corporate body, here's your K-cup. Here's your investment. Here's how you could have the greatest impact. Let me show you the impact and that will show you the investment. So I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And you can see in your bulletin, uh, there's an insert there that has some of the, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. But one of the inserts there has all the passages we're going to cover. Not many verses, but we're going to get through this and we're going to jump to some other ones. So if you don't have a Bible, you need a Bible. And I'll gladly give you a Bible. You can grab one off the back shelf there at the end of the service or during the service if you'd like. Or you can grab one from me at the Information Center at the end of the service. We are a people of the book. Uh, we love the Bible. We want you to get in this, okay? And we're actually going to unpack that a little bit more at the end of this message. But right here, I want you to follow along with me through these verses. And at first, what I want you to do is flip to the back side, take out the pin out of the seat back in front of you, and I want you to write down this big idea. This is Paul's investment advice for the greatest impact we can have as a Christian, as a church. This is Paul's advice. Save your best for what lasts. Save your best for what lasts. Paul's going to tell the church, think beyond 20 years. Th think, think beyond college-bound age. Think eternal. Think forever. Think about the thing that will last in the very, very end of days. Not just the end of your life. Not just the end of your kids and their term of being at your house, but the end of all things. When it all wraps up, what's the biggest payout? What moves from 23 cents to $89? What moves from $1,000 to $390,000? What investment can you make now that have the greatest impact later? Now we're going to travel through these verses, and these are the things we're going to see. We're going to see two ideas, impact and investment. Impact and investment. And the first thing that Paul's going to run through is, why must we think about impact? Why must we think about this idea? Will it last? Will it make it? And then he's going to tell us, this is the thing that will make it. All right, so follow along with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to start with verse 10. It says this, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. What's Paul doing right there? Paul is telling us right up front, this is how I invest my life. And he's talking to the church. I've invested myself into you. Now, how has Paul done this? He uses that illustration. I laid the foundation like a master builder. I put the first piece down. Paul would say later on in the letter that he is a father to this church. He says, you have many guides Many teachers, but none of them are like a father to you. What is he saying there? In chapter 3, Paul will use the analogy just a little bit before these verses. He'll say, I planted and another person watered. What is Paul telling us there? Again, I'm the father. I lay the foundation. I planted. What is he saying? He's saying, I started this church. The first person to introduce you to Jesus Christ was me. That's what he's saying. 
I came to you, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us how he came. He said, I didn't come with wisdom. I wasn't flashy in everything I did. I probably wasn't the best speaker. I wasn't the most powerful and dynamic orator. But I came with you, or came to you with a message of power. That Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. Died a death for all those who haven't lived a perfect life. Which is who? Everybody. And this death was for one reason. Because all of God's creatures needed forgiveness. God provided that forgiveness in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ's son. And now God offers us the gift of forgiveness. And it's exactly that, a gift. Forgiveness is not something we earn. We don't clock in and then get forgiveness as a paycheck. It's not something we work for. It's not a wage, as the Bible would call it. Rather, it's a gift, and a gift is accepted. Accepted how? By faith. Simply saying, I believe you died and rose again, and I confess you as Lord of my life. That is the gospel message. That is the foundational work. That is what he planted. When he says, I am the Father, your Father in the gospel, this is what he's saying. This is gospel. This is good news. Jesus Christ gave us what we so desperately needed, the gift of forgiveness through faith and repentance. That's what he gives him. And that's what Paul says he has done. But now Paul has left. Paul planted the church. Most likely, judging by his patterns in the book of Acts, he raised up elders, leaders in the church. And then once he felt things were good, he went off to go start another place. But now as Paul is gone, other people are building. The foundation is laid, but other people are building. Other people are investing themselves. And this is Paul's concern. Look what he says after. He said, I laid the foundation in verse 10 like a skilled master builder. And then he says, and someone else is building upon it. This is very similar to what happened in verse 6 of the chapter. If you just look up, just gaze up, it says, I planted, verse 6, Apollos, another leader in the first century church, a gifted communicator from what we know, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. This is what he's saying. I came in for the first lap. I was there for the starting gun. I was there for the initial 23 cent investment. But now somebody else is guiding you on every lap. And this is a really a good way to think of Christianity. Christianity is not a moment of faith. Rather, it's a marathon of faith. Every step Every lap, every stride, confessing Christ as Lord, believing that he died and rose again. It's not just a moment, it's a marathon. And Paul is saying other coaches have come into play. Other builders, other investors have come into play. But he's concerned. Because what he's seeing now of the Corinthian church, he's seeing them run in a way that's not wise And so he tells the church, specifically the leaders, this is what he says in the last part of verse 10. He says, let each of you take care how he builds upon it. Be careful. Watch out. Now, now what is Paul's main concern here? Is Paul's concern that he left the church, and now when he hears about the Corinthian church, he hears that people are coming in and they're not preaching Jesus anymore. In fact, they're talking about somebody else. In fact, they're talking against Jesus. Is Paul afraid of false teaching? No, I don't think that's his primary concern. I think he'll address that in our passage as we walk through it, but that's not his primary concern. Paul has used the analogy, I laid the foundation, the work. Jesus Christ gave us forgiveness that we needed. He provided in his death and resurrection. It's accepted by faith, faith alone. But Paul says now somebody's building on it, which means that they haven't destroyed the foundation. They're building on it, but the way they're building is not necessarily wrong or false. It's foolish. It's unwise. It's not productive. The walls aren't plumb, if you will. They're not straight. Things don't match up. You've got four bathrooms all next to each other and one bedroom. Right? It's a very confusing layout. It, 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 sure, the foundation hasn't cracked, but the walls seem very shady. They don't seem to have any sense of weight-bearingness to them. It looks like they're going to fall over. Right? Look at what Paul says. Be careful how you build. 
For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's his small addressing right there to false teaching. It says you can't start over again. But again, this is not his primary concern. His primary concern is foolish teaching, unwise teaching, bad investment. You didn't pick K-cup, right? You, you picked something else, and it's not giving you a great yield. Now, you still made an investment on the foundation of Christ, but it's shaky. Look at how he describes what they're building. He, he continues with this analogy of building a building. It says, again, in verse 11, No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on that foundation, again, what's the foundation? The gospel message. What are they going to build with? He, finds, he lists off six different materials. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw. Each one's work will be manifested for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. What's going on there? He listed off all of those building materials. Now, each one is not really significant in their own regard. If you take them as kind of two groups, groups of three, the first three would last. If fire came to a building, they would last. Now, the other three would not last. Wood, that burns. Hay, straw, that burns. And we know that lesson, right? We've, we've seen that throughout California. We know what catches on fire. Paul is saying here is if you invest wrongly, in the end, the payout won't be great. It'll burn up. It won't last. This is why Paul is saying invest, save your best for what lasts, what endures, what's imperishable. Because a day is coming, a test is coming. And every investment you make in your life is true in this way. Every investment, which is pretty much all of your life, all of your life is an investment. Relationally, socially, economically, spiritually, everything you do now is an investment for later. The question is, will it pass the test of impact? Just like when you trade out that stock or you sell that stock off, what's the payout? If it's less than you first paid, what happened? You, you failed the test. Your investment was bad. It didn't do what you wanted it to do. Paul is saying all of our lives... All of our investments spiritually will come to a day, a day of scrutiny. And this day isn't now, and this day isn't designed by men. God doesn't go at the end of our life and say, what do you guys think? Right? How did you think the investment was? It's not initiated by man. Scrutiny is not initiated by man. Paul is actually not concerned of our people going to approve of my life in ministry the way that I build the church. He's not concerned about that. He's not even concerned about the now of it. Scrutiny comes later, comes in the future, and it comes from where? It's upward. It comes from God. God will bring scrutiny to the investments you've made in your life. And some things will burn. They'll burn. And then look what he says the payout is. If any of the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. Now, that reward is not heaven. Now, that reward is in heaven, but it's not heaven. Again, this is where I think another indication he's not talking about false teaching. He's not talking about wrong teaching. It's not an issue of salvation. If you're gods or not, it's not that. This is an issue about false teaching, unwise teaching, bad investment. Look at the last verse. This test brings scrutiny, a fire of scrutiny on the works that we invest our lives in. And it says, if one's works is burned up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be what? Saved, but only as through fire. Here's the imagery here. Is that a leader will come up and say, okay, here's what I built, Lord. Here's the foundation of Jesus Christ, the gospel message. Forgiveness was needed. It was provided. It must be accepted by faith. I presented that, but here, let me show you how I built up on that. Not contrary to that, but I built up on that. And God will bring his fire. And if nothing lasts but the foundation, it's the only thing that's left. 
Will the man be saved? Yes, but he'll smell like smoke. He'll walk into heaven smelling like smoke. Smelling like that campfire. That's what he'll smell like. What is Paul telling us right here? Now, primarily, again, I think he's talking about leaders. He's talking specifically about teachers, I think. But in the general, he's talking about what? Building the church. So sure, leaders need to hear this warning first and foremost. Pastors, elders, they need to hear this, right? That our lives as an investment to God will suffer through scrutiny at the very end. And hopefully there's something there that remains that we'll be rewarded for. But I think he's talking, we can press this even further because every follower of Jesus Christ in the New Testament church, every follower is expected to build the church. It's not just we watch the showmen on stage. No, we participate in the building of the infrastructure. So all of us really should examine our lives and say, is, there, is what I'm investing in going to last? Okay, I get it. I, 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 I understand. I need to think eternal. I need to think forever impact. That's what I need to think of. And you think, what's going to stand the test of the fire? What's going to stand this idea? But what's the work? Like all Paul has said is, think of impact. Think of eternal impact. Think of lasting impact. Think beyond 20 years. What he has not told us yet is, what's the K-cup? Right? What's the investment? What lasts? What goes the test of time? What endures? What is imperishable? What's the gold? What's the silver? What's the precious stone? If I see this day in the future of divine scrutiny on my life that will burn up anything that wasn't wisely built, then what should I do right now? Right? What's my investment right now? It's the same thing we're asking ourselves for our children's college fund. What can I invest in now that will ensure that they can get through, survive college financially? What investment now will ensure that we won't smell like smoke in the end? Yeah, we'll make it. We'll make it, but as my grandmother used to say, by the skin of our teeth. I didn't know teeth had skin, but apparently to her, right, they did. What's she saying there? You barely made it. How can we invest now? What's the building? What's the work that Paul is talking about? I want to share with you a couple verses just surrounding our passage and a couple more when Paul talks to his church. Because I think Paul actually makes it very, very clear what the work is, what the K-cup is, what's the gold, what's the silver, what's the precious stone, what's the work that will last, what's the investment we should do. If we just continue on with our analogy, all we have to do is answer the question, what's the building? What's the building that's, that's being erected on this foundation? What's, what's the building? Look at verse 16. It says this, do you not know that you, which is plural, do you not know that y'all, the church, is what? God's temple. And that God's spirit dwells in you. What's the building? What's the precious stone, the gold? What's the cake cup? You. The church. Paul is saying this, are you going to pass God's scrutiny in the end? That's what he's saying. Are you building the church in such a way, again, I think he's talking primarily to leaders, are you building the church in such a way that people's faith will finish? Or are you building a church, and I think this is directly in line with his kind of rebuke in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Are you building a church on flashy wisdom, on the opinions of men? That's his whole rebuke in the first two chapters of the book of Corinthians. Are, are you building a following rather than a group of faithfulness? Are you building a crowd rather than confessing Christians? Are you building a sense of, here's these men, here's these methods, and, and many are coming to see the men and the methods. As James would say, the brother of Jesus Christ, in a very poignant way, are you filling your church with demon faith? Faith that assents to some facts. 
that, that would, would pick the right questions or answers on a quiz. A, a faith that is connected to Christ but does not confess Him as Lord. Are you building something that won't last in the end? I think the investment, the K-cup, is the faith of others finishing. It's the faith of others finishing. Let me just read to you how Paul talks to his church. Okay, jump over one letter. So we're in 1 Corinthians. Move past 2 Corinthians. Jump to the book of Galatians. Look at how Paul talks about this. Now think about Paul investing his own investment of his own life and the spiritual health of a church. Look at how he talks. I'm going to show you three passages just to show you that I think this is very clear that the investment Paul wants us to have, the impact that Paul is looking for us to achieve is grounded and rooted in the faith of others finishing. That's what will last. And that's what we should give our best towards. Look Galatians chapter 4 verse 9. Look what Paul says. Now think of that analogy again that he used of the, 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 the day, the end of things, when God wraps things up and the scrutiny that comes. Okay, think of that fiery day. Verse 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back? Again, they're leaving. How can you turn back to the weak and to the worthless elementary principles of the world? What Paul would call wisdom in 1 Corinthians 1, whose slaves, you once, uh, whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years. Look at this verse. This is Paul's primary pastoral concern right here. This is Paul's paranoia, if you will, in ministry. It's what wakes him up in the middle of the night. Right here. Verse 11. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Now what happened there? They started so good. Right? Didn't Paul just say that? Man, you were there. I leave and now you're turning away and you're going away from Christ and you're moving away from him. Yeah, I was there at the starting gun. I saw your feet moving. I saw you get out of the blocks. I saw the clay start to move. I saw your legs churning. I saw your arms pumping. I saw you breathe. I saw you sweat. But I moved away. I get to lap two and I don't see you anymore. What happened to you? And what is Paul saying? I'm afraid I labored in vain. I built something that didn't last. Flip over again. Move past Galatians, past the book of Ephesians. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Again, I want to do this, uh, do this for you just to show you that this is Paul's primary concern. Three churches. We looked at, well, actually four. Corinthians, the church at Corinth. We looked at the church at Galatia. Now look at the church of Philippi. Again, Paul's pastoral concern in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 says this. Do all things without grumbling and disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of truth. Notice this. So that in the day of Christ, what is he talking about? That day, the day of scrutiny. I may be poured out, oh sorry, Where did I, oh, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. What is he saying there? Keep going, keep running, start to finish, make it, because if you don't, what is he saying? I labored in vain. Paul doesn't think his salvation is at risk. He just doesn't want to smell like smoke. He, doesn't want, he wants something there to last. Look again. Again, past uh, Philippians, past the book of Colossians. And we're going to look at the church of Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5. He says this. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer. Man, this is probably the most intense one. He said he was afraid before. I can bear it no longer. It is nagging at me. I sent to learn about your faith. I got to know. I, I just have to know. For fear that someone tempted 
or some, somehow the tempter had tempted you, look at this last phrase, and our labor would be in, what does it say? In vain. What is Paul's concern? Paul's concern is this. I'm building these churches. We're building church. Building these communities of faith. And Paul's saying his one concern is that that faith would finish. Would make it all the way to the end. Paul's not satisfied with decisions for Jesus. Paul's not satisfied with moments of faith. Does Paul celebrate those things? Absolutely. But as my grandmother used to say, you don't count your chickens before they what? Hatch. We're all in Southern California. None of us own chickens. But why do we know that phrase? What is it saying to you there? Don't count the payout. This thing, shares were 23 cents. Don't count your dollar bills now. Right? You invested $1,000. Don't count them yet. Don't just run through, flip the stack, and do it again. Oh, look, I doubled my money. We don't count our Christians until they hatch. We don't count the work finish complete, built wisely, till faith starts, endures, and lasts till the end. Paul is saying, I want your faith to finish. But hold on and grasp this reality. Because I think that's something that we, we, at times, have lost in the American church. Is we've lost the idea of a during faith, but we've also lost the idea of others' faith. Notice how Paul does not see a satisfying sense of victory if he's the only one in heaven. Right? Paul's not satisfied with smelling like smoke when he gets there. Paul doesn't consider it a victory if he gets his private pass through the pearly gates. Paul is not happy if he goes to heaven by himself. But what have we often done in American Christianity? I don't think intentionally, but we've made it such a point of emphasis, we've forgotten those around us. That we have privatized our pursuit of the things of God. Well, I'm going. Well, I'm good. Is that what Paul would say? Would Paul reassure you there? No, Paul would say, friend, you're going to smell like smoke in the end. Don't be satisfied. Don't be happy if you get to the end and you're the only one there. If there's no one there because of you, What's the investment? We save our best for what lasts and what will last. What's the investment now? Faith finishing in others. I want you to open your bulletin because I want to show you just very, very practically how we are going to invest in this idea as a leadership. Okay, this is going to be a lot. But I'm going to try to just walk through it here because I want to be very practical for you. So oftentimes we try to just say one thing, one point, one big thing. But I got three things for you. But here's why. They'll unfold throughout the year. But as pastors and elders, we have decided that we are going to invest in faith finishing. Not just starting, but faith finishing. How are we going to do that? In your bulletin, there's this fun little card right here. Everybody grab that and show that to me real quick. Okay, it's orange. On one side, it's orange and gray. On the other side, it says family reading. Here's what we're doing. We want to invest in your faith finishing. We want to invest in your faith growing. So how are we going to do that? Again, we've taken my little strategy here. We're not starting our plan here until you see January 8th. What's that? That's tomorrow. Okay, so that's nice. We didn't start January 2nd, January 8th. Here's what we want to do as a church. We want to read the Bible every single day. Now, we're, we're kind of lowering the bar a little bit here, making it more achievable, shrinking the win, if you will. You're not going to read through the Bible in one year. Now, if you do that, great. Es extra credit, we'll give you a gold star. You could sit up front in every message. We'll give that to you. Okay? We're going to do this. Our goal is simply this, daily communication with God. All of our people, 
communicating with God daily. How are we going to help you run that race? How are we going to invest in you? How are we going to see your faith finish? This is how we're going to do it. We're going to give you one of these every month. This is only January here. We're only reading two chapters a day. Now, sometimes I sneak in an extra chapter. That's only to keep a good pace. But you're only reading two chapters a day. Just take one in the morning, one at night. You're going to check that little box when you're done. Keep this in your Bible. And follow along with us. Every month, we'll keep giving you this. Every week, on Wednesday, you'll get a video from us. Not scripted, not planned, just opening up, hey, I'm journeying with you on this. I'm going to do those videos and just say, hey, here's what God's been speaking to me throughout the week through his word. And I encourage you to do it. Every month, we're going to remind you. Every week, we're going to remind you. And hopefully every day, you'll find yourself communicating with God. Imagine your spiritual growth if every day you were in God's word. That sounds like we're building with gold, precious stone. We want to see your faith finish. But we want to see faith start in other people too. Take this, this guy out here, this little calendar. You got a beautiful picture of Ron there. You got to love that. You can frame that. That's fine. Ron has permitted that. You can put it on a dartboard if you like, however you want to use that. Ron is okay with that. Uh, wear your USC stuff next Sunday. Uh, so that's going to be a fun time to celebrate that. But on the back side there, it says make a difference. There's a ton of dates on here. Here's what this is. We want you to see faith start in other people. I'll tell you this right here. If you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have never seen somebody come to faith, you're missing one of the greatest things in your spiritual life. And you, you know it. Just think back. Think back the first time you shared your faith and somebody grabbed a hold of it. What was that like? Do you remember that? I remember that. My friend Brandon, when I was in junior high, and I botched the message. <laughs> I remember becoming a Christian. I walked in there, and I tried to tell him how to become a Christian. It was so bad, he wanted to become a Christian, but I had no idea how to get him to be one. So I had to take him to my youth pastor and say, look, he wants to love Jesus, but I couldn't remember how to explain it. Will you help me? But I'll tell you what, that moment, that moment was incredible. I had a strategy in student ministry when I was in student ministry about five years ago. I knew this. If I can get a leader in the first three months to not only share their faith, but see faith rise in a student, if they had that one experience, I had them for the rest of their life. Because there's nothing like seeing faith start in somebody. There's nothing like it. And if you haven't experienced that, we have missions trips. You'll be trained to do that. You'll get to do that. We have community work. You'll get to do those things. We have classes that Mike has. If you can memorize one verse, you can share your faith. One verse, and you probably already know it. We want you to see faith start in other people. We want your faith to grow. That's why we're reading the Bible. We want you to see faith start in other people. That's why we're designing all of these events for that to happen for you. But lastly, and this is not in your bulletin, this is in your seat back in front of you, is we want you to see faith in other people finish. Make it long term. And you know what the key to that is? Fellowship. Being in a life group. Being there where people watch you run every lap. Are there to encourage you when you fall. Or you're there to encourage somebody. This is the brilliance and the beauty of a life group. Jumping in, diving in, saying, I want to see the faith in others finish. That's how I want to invest. Two weeks, we're going to kick off our life group cycle. All our life groups will start up. If you're not in one, get in one. Fill up that card, bring it to the information center. I want to leave you just with one idea as we close out. One challenge, one question. You know, oftentimes we evaluate our life and we ask ourselves this question. How many people, well, we ask ourselves probably the question, who and how many will be at my funeral? I don't know if you've ever asked that question of yourself. Who and how many will be at my funeral? I think a more biblical question is, who and how many will be at the final day with me? Not how many will come to celebrate my life, but how many will be there with me enjoying eternal life? Will there be anybody there? anyone alongside of you. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are to us in Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that you invested in us, that you gave 
to see an impact in us, a payout in us. Father, you gave of your son, Jesus Christ. We so desperately need your forgiveness. And you so graciously provided that forgiveness. And God, we embrace that forgiveness not because we've earned it, we've worked for it, we've done enough good for it. God, simply by taking it in faith. God, I pray that we would mimic the Savior. We're nobody's Savior. We're not Jesus Christ. We're not the hero of the story. But we are called to live as best we can like him. God, make us a church that invests in other people. That invests in other people finishing the race. In other people's faith finishing all the way to the end. God, make us master builders. God, make us a church that doesn't build with, with hay, with straw, things that burn up in the end. God, make us a church that builds wisely. I don't want to be the only one to make it in the end. God, I don't want to smell like smoke in the end. I want there to be hundreds, thousands of people on that final day. I don't want to be alone at that last moment. God, I want there to be so many to walk into your presence, to enjoy the Savior. God, make us a church like that. It's in Christ's name I pray.